The team are preparing to search the ground, scouring the desert like a police search team. The whole plateau is limestone, so dark meteorites stand out pretty good against the pale limestone. Um, and there's not too much vegetation, so you can see the ground pretty well. So what, what am I looking for? Something metal and dark? Yeah, when they've been out here for a while, they rust a little bit. They have chunks of metal in them, so you get a kind of a dark, rusty texture. After searching for quite a while, we've not had much luck. Hey, guys, I think I've got one here. Well, that's a beauty. Is that a meteorite? Yeah, it's a lovely one. I mean, I'm, this is incredible that it's something from outer space. That's it is amazing. amazing. What is amazing is that it actually makes it to the surface at all. Something that size might have been part of an object the size of a washing machine or a small car at the top of the atmosphere. And as it punches into the atmosphere at high speed, the surface gets melted and stripped off and a new surface exposed and melted and stripped off until it, you whittle down to something about that big. But I mean, it's heavy, so that small car is a small car of rock weighing tons? Yes. So thin air does this to solid rock? Yes. That's remarkable. When meteors hit the atmosphere, they compress the air in front of them, which generates intense heat. Layer upon layer gets stripped away until most are completely burnt up. We see this process in action when particles no larger than grains of sand burn up as they streak across the night sky. Shooting stars. One object that didn't burn up was Thea, Earth's twin. Earth's early collision with its twin was also vital for our planet in many other ways. For a start, it probably resulted in Earth's core becoming larger. And because it's made of iron, the churning of this huge metal core generates a powerful magnetic field. It's possible to see this magnetic field at work. This is the aurora. You're watching the magnetic field deflecting the sun's dangerous solar wind. But the huge molten core contributes something else essential for life on Earth. A way of helping to regulate the planet's temperature. It's a remarkable system. Magma heated by the core rises towards the Earth's surface. As it spreads sideways, the Earth's crust is very slowly dragged apart. This moves the continents, creating the Earth's restless and ever-changing surface. But crucially for life, the core does more than just shape the planet. Where these plates collide, it creates massive volcanic eruptions, which release carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Today, we think of carbon dioxide as a dangerous greenhouse gas that leads to global warming. But throughout Earth's long history, carbon dioxide has played a vital role in keeping our planet the right temperature for complex life to survive. there was one final, rather special gift that the collision with Earth's twin bestowed upon our planet. As the debris from the explosion orbited the Earth, it began to coalesce until it formed a new planetary body, the Moon.
But because of the way it formed, ours is unusually large, and it's made an unusually big difference to Earth's development. As the moon orbits Earth, its gravity pulls the water in the oceans towards it. The constantly changing tidal zone this creates provided an evolutionary testing ground for Earth's early creatures. But the tides would happen without the moon and are not the moon's greatest contribution to life on Earth. Without the moon, Earth's temperature might regularly switch from boiling hot to way below freezing. Such wild climatic swings would have made the planet uninhabitable. Yet there's something rather strange happening to the moon that means we shouldn't take it for granted. Meet Jerry Wyant. Every morning, he rides up to the McDonald Observatory in West Texas. And it's thanks to his work that we know something extraordinary about the moon. How many times do you make this journey? Every day for, for 37 years. <laughs> 37 years? Yeah, on this bike. You're joking. No, th this, this one bike. Nice head up there, is it? Yep. Jerry's job is deceptively simple. Once a day, he fires a laser at the moon in order to measure its distance from Earth. Measuring the distance to the moon is quite simple. Uh, we start with a bundle of light. We send it through a telescope. Uh, when it reaches the moon, it hits a reflector, and, and it comes back toward Earth. We intercept that light with our telescope, and what we do is we time when the light left, and we time when the light comes back, and that's our data. Jerry's target on the moon is a panel made up of individual reflectors that were left by astronauts from the first moonwalk and later Apollo missions. It takes just 2.5 seconds for the light to return to Earth. Jerry has measured this figure every day for decades, and his results reveal something remarkable. The moon is receding uh, 3.8 centimeters per year, which kind of surprised me. I, I didn't really give it a thought of whether it was standing still or moving, but, but it is. It's moving away, and eventually we'll lose it. So the moon will not be with us forever. Eventually, it will drift away into space, and Earth will lose its climatic stability. But there's no need to panic. It'll take billions of years. Earth's chance collision with its twin was perhaps the critical moment in its history. By this theory, it ensured that the planet held on to its protective atmosphere. It gave Earth a magnetic shield against the dangerous solar wind. And it left us the moon that provides climatic stability. If the collision had never happened, Earth may never have been a home to complex life. We've seen the extraordinary consequences of just one chance event on the Earth's destiny.